would like to begin my talk with what all good social scientists should begin their talk with, and that is Icelandic women. <laughs> There's something about them. Is it the intensity? Is it the sweaters? Is it the hair? No, it's none of those. It's the steel blue eyes. I'm sure many of you have come across an Icelandic woman before and seen those steel blue eyes like that, that pierce through your soul, like look inside you. This guy has, I know. He's been touched before, too. Well, it might sound crazy, but for me who studies sexual fantasies, this is actually where my study of sexual fantasies began. I was on a plane from London to Iceland. I'm sitting at the window seat, and I'm looking down the aisle, and I see this gorgeous Icelandic woman with those steel blue eyes, you know, pierced through your soul. And this middle-aged man, and I thought, ooh, hopefully she sits next to me. But of course, like fate would have it, they're both walking down the aisle, both looking my way, and he sits down right next to me, and I think, oh, what, just my luck. Not today, Mike Anderson, not today. <laughs> but then she's, she kind of looks at him rather strangely and hovers over him and says, excuse me, sir, but I think you're in my seat. Now, as you can imagine, my excitement was very strong at this point. She's going to sit next to me. We're going to use the whole plane ride from London to Iceland to build rapport. We're going to laugh. We're going to cry. We're going to frolic. We get to Iceland. We're going to frolic some more. And we're going to make Icelandic babies. <laughs> that was in my future. A plus B equals C. But, as fate would have it once again, he turns to the Icelandic woman and says, well, you know what? I'm looking at my ticket, and uh, I... I notice that I'm just supposed to be in the row ahead of you. Why don't we just switch seats? <laughs> yes. I don't know if any of you have ever had Icelandic babies taken away from you. <laughs> but it is a terrible, terrible feeling. In that moment, I lost something. Now, fear got me that day. I should have said, no, sir. She's supposed to sit here. You don't understand. A plus B equals C. But I did not. But. In that moment, when she agreed with them and turned to go to her seat, she looked at me with the steel blue eyes. And in that moment, she imprinted a sexual fantasy inside of me. It was like that movie Inception, instead of it's a sexual fantasy within a sexual fantasy deep in my subconscious. <laughs> Quite power they have. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is a wonderful sexual fantasy that she's just giving me. Do I ever share this? with anybody. Now, at that time, I was getting my master's, and I was studying taboo topics in romantic relationships. What are the topics that we avoid in romantic relationships? What are the topics that we consider off limits, no way, Jose, when it comes to our romantic relationships? And here we have sex is the big one, prior relationships, we don't like talking about our past partners, discussion of exclusivity or state of the relationship conversation, we don't like having that conversation about, you know, what are we, what aren't we? Like, Whoa, are we drifting apart, or what do you think about getting married? Something like that. We're very nervous about having those conversations, along with politics, religion, and money. But one of the things all of these studies had in common was sex was at the top of the list in terms of taboo topics. So for me, I was naturally interested in sex, or I should say, the lack of communication about sex <laughs> in romantic relationships. Now, not all sex topics are considered the same, right? Another study came around and said, OK, we've got all these different ideas on what people talk about when they talk about sex and romantic relationships. And the most avoided one of all those was sexual fantasies. There's something about sexual fantasies. It's the top of the top when it comes to topics that we avoid. And so then I thought to myself, OK, I want to know, A, why people are avoiding it. B, the people who do discuss it, are they receiving benefits from that, and then how, of course, does that discussion, or lack of discussion, relate to our sexual and relational satisfaction? So what I did is I went out there and gathered sexual fantasies from 500 people. Jealous. <laughs> uh, and I also looked at, okay, did they act out their sexual fantasy? Did they disclose their favorite or most recurring sexual fantasy, fantasy I should say? to their current or last partner, and then, of course, looking at their sexual and relationship scores, amongst other variables as well. 
And I think it, what I found is really groundbreaking because no one's ever looked at, okay, what are the benefits that we might have talking about one of the most taboo topics in romantic relationships? So I came out with four major benefits that people had. A, if they talked about it, they were more likely to act out the fantasy. If your sexual fantasy involves having sex under a windmill with Don Quixote, I'm not gonna guess that. <laughs> I've tried, but unless you tell me you wanna have sex under you know, a windmill with me dressed as Don Quixote, I'm not gonna get there. So a lot of times discussing that obviously leads to acting out of the sexual fantasy, which also helps with sexual satisfaction and improving our sex lives. A lot of times in our sexual fantasies, we have certain maybe practices in terms of the what's going on, the where's going on that might be sexual preferences or might be something that turns us on sexually. So by acting this out, maybe it's like a role play you've always wanted to act out when someone's dressed as a nurse, you're dressed as Don Quixote, and we're on the beach. Right? We have a hot big bang. I was listening. There's a hot big bang. <laughs> and you want that on a beach. Great, you can have that. But I think what's really interesting also though is I found that disclosing this and having this conversation isn't just beneficial for your sex life, it's also beneficial to your relationship as a whole. Look at the other things that I found. People who talked about this topic also said that they have a deeper emotional connection, a deeper bond with their current partner. And I think that goes to the fact that you're very vulnerable when you disclose something. The fact that you're disclosing something so taboo, it can really bring you closer together as a couple and also really open the floodgates for communication. The idea being if you can discuss something so taboo like sexual fantasies, well then talking about some of the other stuff is a lot easier. But the big takeaway was this. If you disclosed your favorite or most recurring sexual fantasy to your partner, you had and acted that fantasy out, you had significantly higher levels of sexual satisfaction than those that didn't disclose their sexual fantasy or those that didn't act it out. Which might make sense, right? Okay, we acted out sexual fantasy, we did it, might improve our sex lives. But the more important thing is this. For those individuals that disclosed their favorite or most reoccurring sexual fantasy to their partner or their last partner in a relationship, regardless of whether they acted out that fantasy, they still had significantly higher sexual satisfaction and relational satisfaction scores than those that didn't have that conversation. So it didn't even matter if they'd act out a sexual fantasy, couples that talk about it have better sex lives and better overall romantic relationships. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, Mike, well not all, not all sexual fantasies are created equal. Some people might have sexual fantasies involving hot big bangs, some people might have sexual fantasies that are just very small, right, just sex in the shower. Some people might have sexual fantasies involving this very stage right here or the seat that you're sitting in right now. <laughs> Obviously, what about men versus females? It didn't matter. The theme of your sexual fantasy didn't matter. The gender of, your, of who you were didn't matter. How long you were in a relationship for, because you had to be at least in a relationship longer than two months for the study, it didn't matter that benefit permeated through all those different variables. Now there was an interesting thing that I found in that the level of involvement or specificity of the sexual fantasy did make a difference in terms of your sexual satisfaction. So I coded each sexual fantasy in terms of specificity or involvement, a scale from zero to three. Zero means you didn't have a sexual fantasy. Three means you had a very elaborate sexual fantasy. You had a very elaborate sexual fantasy. There was a who, there was a what, there was a when, there was a why, and most importantly, there was a how. So, because I'm sure you're all very interested in nosy, I'm gonna read some sample three sexual fantasies. My sexual fantasy, this is a level three sexual fantasy, the highest level of involvement. My sexual fantasy included being taken into the bedroom, having previously dressed for an intimate evening under my professional clothes of the day and being slowly undressed, tied seductively to the bed, and pleasured by my, by my romantic partner's mouth all over my body. Silk ties at the arms and feet, blindfolded, but with the warmth and scent of candles lighted around the room." End quote. Some might consider that a more very traditional fantasy, but I didn't matter traditional or non-traditional. All I was looking for was specificity involvement. Let me give you a second level three fantasy, and for the art of it, I will read it in a more Shakespearean way. It starts with a candlelit dinner with Rupert Grint. 
except he has a mullet. <laughs> he climbs across the table towards me, throwing our dinner to the floor. He takes me by the hand and leads me to another room where there is a hot tub full of vanilla pudding. <laughs> he throws me into the pudding head first. Unfortunately, I can't swim in pudding, but he jumps in and rescues me. <laughs> I've never been so turned on or so covered in pudding in all my life. <laughs> Little did I know, while struggling to rescue me from the pudding, all of our clothes just happened to slide off. Turner Gill suddenly appears as our naked lifeguard. Probably no one remembers what that is. Uh, Turner Gill suddenly appears as our naked lifeguard. He began giving me the hottest, wettest mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. Not necessarily on my lips that breathe. It's not over. <laughs> Exhilarated, they came at me and started tag-teaming me. It was, the, it was getting hot and heavy. After we reached our steaming climax, we clothed, shake hands, and go our separate ways." End quote. Now, obviously, that is very different than level one sexual fantasies, which involve in a field full of grass. He's wearing lots of leather and just plain old slutty nurse. Um, uh, so they're very different in that regard, but here was the most important thing. If you looked at who in my study had the lowest levels of sexual satisfaction, it's those individuals that had level three sexual fantasies and hadn't or didn't disclose them, either because they couldn't or because they were worried about their partner set. So those individuals that really have elaborate involved sexual fantasies but don't feel like they can disclose it, their sexual satisfaction, their sex lives are much significantly lower than people who have disclosed their sexual fantasies regardless of what level of sexual involvement uh, the fantasy had. So it's a very interesting dynamic. If you look at people with level three sexual fantasies, those individuals who disclosed it, their sex life was way up here. If you didn't disclose it, it was way down here. The difference was highly significant. Now, another thing interesting to point out once again is, as I said, it didn't matter what your theme of your sexual fantasy was, you still get the benefit by disclosing it, but everyone wants to know, okay, what's the most common one for men and women? And what I found is there was definitely a common sexual theme for women, but not as much for men. The most common theme for, for women was themes of dominance and submission. Now I know what you're thinking, okay, this is Fifty Shades of Grey thing, but I did this study before the Fifty Shades of Grey ever came out. 40% of females have a sexual fantasy that involves some level of dominance or submission. Either that be a rape fantasy or being tied up, being handcuffed in some way, shape, or form, submission, dominance. So basically what I'm trying to say is four out of 10 women in this audience have that very sexual fantasy. You're, all, see, you're looking all around right now, aren't you? <laughs> if you think that's bad, try having 500 sexual fantasies in your head. <laughs> I can no longer go to Frisbee golf courses. <laughs> Makes you think now, isn't it? So we see that fairly consistent in females, but you know what? We don't really see, interestingly enough, we don't see that same theme of dominance or submission, even the other way around, in men. For men, the themes were all over the place. There was one theme that came out, 15% of men, which was the most, did have a theme involving multiple partners. <laughs> so about 15, 16% of men, that, their most common theme for men, with, but again, it's only 15, 16% involved, there was an extra person there. Whether that be a female, whether that be a male, whether that be Don Quixote, doesn't matter. That was the most common theme for men. But a lot of times I'm asked, okay, who's the most common person in sexual fantasies? And I wanna end with this because I think it's really important and I think it's almost comforting that I say this. A lot of times we have sexual fantasies and we don't wanna know our partner's sexual fantasy because we're worried, like, oh my goodness, they're gonna say like Taylor Swift, they're gonna say George Clooney, they're gonna say you know, someone specific that I can't be. So of all these people that I got sexual fantasies from, 500 people, only 5% of individuals named a specific person that wasn't their current partner. It's only 30 people out of 500, their sexual fantasy is a specific person. That's really low.
So we're always constantly worried. Now, some people did have sexual fantasies like, oh, it's a firefighter, it's a fire uh, marshal, it's a cop, it's a robber, it's a football player. But that's a character, that's not a real person. So we're so worried that people are thinking, okay, they're thinking about Taylor Swift the whole time they're having sex with me. Not really, no. It, people with their sexual fantasy, they're, they're much more specific and much more desiring the where, the when, the what, and specifically how the sexual fantasy more so than the who of the sexual fantasy. So again, I leave with that idea that it's very important to have these sexual fantasies. We all do, most of us do anyway. And I'm not saying this is a magical pill that you're gonna take and it's gonna cure everything in your romantic relationship, it's gonna cure your sex life. I can't say that. It's not a capital T truth, but what I can say is that what I've discovered is that those individuals who share their sexual fantasies with their partner have better sex lives and establish deeper emotional connections and bonds and have better communication than those that don't. And I think that's a powerful takeaway message. Again, can't say it works for everybody, for the majority of individuals, we talk about generalizability. Now, I promised you I'd say the most calm person in these sexual fantasies. But again, take this with a grain of salt because we're dealing with only like 30 to 35 people out of 500 that actually name a specific person. But maybe this will help you at trivia night or something like that or impress your friends. But what I discovered, the most named person in sexual fantasy research is Flo from the progressive commercials. <laughs> And the craziest thing is, she is not Icelandic. <laughs> I want to thank you all for listening so much. Have a terrific day. <laughs>